Is Smash Ultimate dying? Don't answer that. There's been a good deal of conversation over the last six months discussing whether or not the lifespan of yet another Smash title was coming to an unforgiving end. From over-centralizing characters and strategies making a rise, consistently longer top eights, and whatever this is. Oh, hey, Red's ledge, hey, hey, radio down there. What? Radio They're playing down, the game. Like, no. Shut up. Remember? Shut no. up. The Ultimate community has needed something or someone to make a move perhaps even a big move. And fortunately for everyone, there was one event that was looking to make a change to this bleak reality. To kick off another year of Smash Ultimate in North America, the recently acquired Luminosity Makes Moves series presented their fifth edition of the New York-based event, Luminosity Makes Big Moves 2024. This annual accumulation of the strongest Ultimate players in the world has been a mainstay in the competitive community since 2018, where it marked itself as Ultimate's first true international event. While perhaps in 2024, the international sentiment doesn't hold as much weight due to Steve being banned and Umaberg conveniently being held the same weekend, we saw a bracket stocked to the brim with North America's best players and some of the most intriguing storylines to start the year. The rise of New Blood, the ending of an era for others, and for one player in particular, a legend would be upheld while he continued to etch his name into Ultimate's history. Now, we don't want to touch on this for too long, but it is worth noting that this was a Steve Band event, as most of the Make Move series are. As a result, we saw a different, and I'll just say it, very refreshing collection of characters. Given the rather grim-looking state of Top 8s and Smash Ultimate, we've seen many fan-favorite players being featured less and less while many of the game's most troubling characters have been seeing more and more success. Comparing this event to the other major happening the same weekend in Umabura SP10, we can see a clear difference between not only the top 8s, but the general character pool. With Steve Legal at Umabura, we saw him dominate the lower ends of that bracket as by far the most popular character, having 18 representatives in the top 384 of the bracket. But as we got further and further in, we saw something very curious become clear. Akola was the only Steve player Player, not just in the top 8, but in the top 48 of the entire event. Now, this video isn't meant to sway your opinion on this topic one way or another, but it is a very interesting piece of data to take a look at and consider when you're looking at future events. All that being said, this was a stars aligning moment for the competitors at Let's Make Big Moves. Steve was banned and a lot of the Japanese heavy hitters were over at Umabura, which afforded North American non-Steve players an opportunity to shine. So let's talk about it. There was so much that happened at this event. Honestly, too much to cover in a single video, but we're gonna have to take a look at a few of the biggest over and under performances of the weekend before we tackle the victor of this event. By the way, if you want to see even more coverage of LMBM and other Smash Ultimate events, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. The event's fourth seed, DeBuzz, is one of North America's pillars of consistency. With quite the run in the back half of 2023, DeBuzz was clearly making a case for a top 15 in the world, if not stronger. And despite being on his home turf in New York, DeBuzz played far from that general level of player we expect from this god of consistency. In the final match of his first wave of pools, we saw DeBuzz match up against Tech Texas Toon Link main Spritzy. Spritzy has had some solid results in the past, being the number one ranked player in their subregion, but what was about to happen would shock everyone in attendance. In a game 5 set, Spritzy managed to clutch out a victory and sent DeBeast to losers top 128. DeBuzz continued his run with a pair of wins over Andrik and Slingshot, but eventually fell 3-1 to to Justice, one of the best Min Min players in the world, ending his run at 49. New Jersey's WebJP has been on a recent spurt of absolute greatness starting last year, and we did mention him on my main channel for Watch the Throne, so check that out over there, but he's been making his case as the best Sheik player in the world, and in my opinion, he's succeeded. Last year started not too great for the Sheik, but he started cleaning up his play with a top 8 at Momocon. Since then, he's had placements like 25th at SSC and 9th at LMMM, and at this event, he continued to uphold that same greatness. His run included victories over Wampi, Jen, Nico, Cola, and he even managed to beat Light after being double eliminated by the Fox at the pre-local event. Webb ended up losing a heartbreaking Game 5 to Sinji and a 3-0 destruction against Spargo, all with solo Sheik, but he secured a respectable ninth place to start his year. MDVA's best player, Oolong, is a solo Wii Fit player that has been slowly making a name for himself over the past few years. Oolong has a near stranglehold over his region, winning nearly every event they enter, but at the major level, we haven't seen quite the same success. They placed a respectable 65th at Let's Make Big Moves and Collision last year, but their last major was SmashCon, a 97th place finishing where the Wii Fit defeated Stroder and Balls Grab. That tag is fucking crazy. Also, I have a note here from Jake that Stroder's current tag is White Girl Save Me, um, and that's also fucking crazy. But regardless, this event would be far and away Oolong's best placement ever, managing to end at 13th with wins over Demon, Soul Arts, Gai Gai, and Captain Cedo, falling only to MK Leo and Tilde. This was undoubtedly one of Wii Fit Trainer's strongest runs of all time, and it puts Oolong on the map as a player to watch out for this year. And the last competitor we'll touch on before jumping into the thick of things is somewhat of a legend, somewhat of a meme, and I'm sure you all know the set that I'm talking about. That's right, we have Sinji. One of the kings of sitting back 
back and letting the opponent come to him, Sinji's Pac-Man crushed their 61st seed. His run included wins over JJ JJ, MBD, MFA, and he won an absolutely grueling Game 5 against WebJP, with every game going to timeout or close to it. He ended up falling to SkyJ and Tilde in back-to-back -back sets, but this marked the best non-T Pac-Man performance in a long time, finishing the event at 9th place. Now, let's dive into what everyone has been waiting for, our top 8. This is what can be described as a mix of Vintage Smash Ultimate paired with a touch of the New Age competition. Top 8 consisted of Sonic, Spargo, Tweak, Light, MKLeo, Meister, Tilde, and SkyJ. And if you saw how the crew battle went for the United States, I'm sure you're not all that surprised by 5 Latin America players taking up spots here, but it was unclear who would take this one home. Sonic's and Spargo have been in a tight race for best in North America and possibly best in the world, and they were the two easy frontrunners for this event. However, with a bracket demon to both of them in light in attendance and other heavy hitters that you can never count out, it was really a toss-up on how this top eight would conclude. In a story that almost wrote itself, Tweak was the player that seemed to be playing on an absolutely different field than the rest of the competition. Coming into this event as the third seed, Luminosity's very own has been on a very interesting path as a competitor over the last year. Tweak ended his 2022 fighting for the title of best player in the world and opened his 2023 looking like he was just that, defending his home region at Let's Make Big Moves. He honestly didn't attend all that many events in 2023 compared to years prior, but in his time he managed to pick up an impressive number of results, with his worst placements being ninth at some of the biggest majors of the year. Far from bad, even for a player of Tweak's caliber. The doubt with Tweak came from his lack of experience playing and defeating one character in particular that he had the luxury of not having to run into at all at this event, Steve. Tweak was notoriously weak against the Block Man, maintaining a 1-3 record versus Syrup since his switch to Steve, 0-2 versus D-Dog, and an ice-cold 0-5 record against Ecola. Yikes. Being able to completely avoid this character boosted Tweak's rates of success significantly. One more stat note, but on top of this character matchup, Tweak's record against the four horsemen of Ultimate had been less than stellar, and this event had half of them. Spargo was the only player in the top four he's had consistent run-ins against, which tend to go back and forth. He hadn't fought Sonics in over a year, and in that time, Sonics had grown exponentially as a player. On top of that, every time he fights either Akola or Mia, well, yeah, that doesn't go super great either. Whether it was a block within the player or how Diddy Kong was being phased out of the meta, how Tweak would perform this weekend was a little bit of a question mark. I mean, hell, while everyone else was picking up Steve, Game & Watch, or even Corrin to counter these oppressive meta options, Tweak decided to put his time into a true needle mover. Banjo. Jokes aside, with his two biggest threats out of the bracket and Tri-State's legacy of upholding victories at this New York-based series, it seemed like this was Tweak's bracket to lose. Tweak's weekend started off as expected for a player with his level of experience, only dropping a single game in round one pools, and he continued to push through without much resistance. His pair of top 128 opponents in Jay Mafia and Dark Wizzy both managed to take a game, but in the end, his ditty was just too much for the Mushroom Kingdom's finest to handle, pushing Tweak through to top 32 winner side. This slated Tweak to fight against a fellow top Tri-State competitor and another one of Ultimate's most exhilarating competitors in Tilde. Tilde was making the case as one of the best in the world last year before his stint of inactivity, so this was chalked up to be one of the best matchups of the event. The two competitors had only faced one time previously at a local where Tweak managed to take it 2-1, and this set similarly would go down to the wire. Games 1 and 2 were Tweak victories, managing to keep Tilde's explosive punish game to a minimum, but a last stock performance in the second showed that Tilde had the answers for this ditty. Tilde opened Game 3 with a major combo and held up this momentum him for the remainder of the game, getting himself on the map with a two-stock. And in game four, these two were fighting as equals, playing around each other's space with expert precision and knowing when and where to push the pace. In a near two-stock, again, Tilde managed to close out game four on Tweak's counterpick and put his back against the wall. Their uniquely optimal punish games were on full display in an attempt to close out the final game of the set. As the timer ticked and interactions were made, it seemed like Tilde had Tweak figured out. Tweak's usual banana-based neutral game was being shut down by Falco's amazing movement, but for a competitor of Tweak's level of skill, and experience, the micro-adjustments were fighting his way back and closing out a victory. This 3-2 victory propelled Tweak into winner's quarters to face off against top Corrin and North America's fastest rising competitor, Shattuck. And some spectators may think that Tweak may struggle against Corrin, especially given his loss to Neo at SmashCon, but Tweak has actually notoriously done very well against this character. He was 2-0 against Shattuck prior to this set and had yet to even drop a game, and he actually got the W in a runback against Neo at Port Priority. But this set went much better for Shattuck than all of their previous encounters the two had. He managed to take Game 1 in a dominant fashion, only losing a single stock to an early SD, and rather than switching off to a different character, Tweak stuck it out with Diddy and tightened up his game plan. Tweak narrowly 
barely won Game 2, but once Tweak started cooking, it was hard to get him to stop. Game 3 was a JV3 masterpiece against Corrin to push it to a final Game 4. And this was looking like another 2 stock from Tweak, but a huge combo on the left side of the screen left a brand new stock up against a Rage Corrin. A scary position to witness. But Tweak, as fearless as ever, was unfazed by this potent position, and he continued to play his game, waiting for Shattuck to approach him in an unsafe manner, and he finally closed the game out with a banana forward smash conversion. When I was talking about Vintage Ultimate earlier, this set is exactly what I meant. In Winter Semis, we saw a matchup between the pair of teammates in MK Leo and Tweak, probably the most classic rivalry in Smash Ultimate. Leo's been on a bit of a downslope over the last year, falling from the clear number one player in the world to a fringe top 10 level player, but this event seemed to be a complete change in pace for this Joker, as he upset Spargo in a 3-1 the round prior. Tweak and Leo hadn't played since last year's Let's Make Big Moves, also in Winter Semis by the way, but with Tweak winning their last four sets, it was going to be MK Leo who needed to prove something here. Game 1 was as close of a game as you could have asked for from these two players. Tweak slowly slipped away with the lead, but Leo brought it back to a last hit situation where we saw a down tilt forwarder from Diddy clean up the game. Game 2 was the complete opposite of that. Tweak was looking like he was getting his warm up friendlies in against a Joker CPU because he absolutely dominated with a 3 stock performance. It really did look like he had an infinite amount of confidence in this matchup the way he was slipping and sliding around the stage. Game 3's tempo was more similar to that of Game 1, with the two competitors keeping stocks even through the early phases of the game, but as the last stock rolled around, Leo seemed to be sneaking away with the lead. On his last stock, Tweak put up an incredible campaign as he asserted his dominant advantage state upon Leo, pushing Joker to a killable percentage, but Leo ended up finding a back air on Tweak to close out the game and put himself on the board. Oh boy, it's Game 4 Leo. Now, if you know the legend of Game 4 MK Leo, you would know that in these situations, down 2-1 to one and going into Game 4, he tends to, uh, go fucking ballistic and bring back the set. And with how Game 4 started, it seemed like Leo was able to tap into that legend. Tweak found a scrappy down tilt conversion to finally clean off the stock from the Joker and potentially get himself back into the game, and despite being down, Tweak found a way to tap into another gear himself, getting this game to a last stock situation. While things were still going great for Leo, this situation right here, this singular slip on the banana, cost MK Leo his whole stock, going on a 30 second stretch where he didn't get a single hit on Tweak. Tweak ultimately secured the set out 3-1 and secured his spot in Winner's Finals. On the other side of bracket, Sonics and SkyJ matched up in what seems like an absolutely impossible matchup for Incineroar, but against all odds, SkyJ was able to push this set to a Game 5. In the end though, it was the number one seeded Sonics that managed to clutch out the win and clock his spot into Winner's Finals. This would end up being Tweak and Sonics' first matchup since CEO 2022, where Sonics took the set 3-0 over a combination of Tweak, Sephiroth, and Diddy. Since that time, Sonics has continued to rise and make a name for himself himself at the highest level, and Tweak has fallen off a little bit. With two competitors that played this cerebrally, it would be a chess match, but unfortunately for Sonics, this chess match was on Tweak's home turf. Sonics got the first stock of the set by catching a monkey flip from Tweak, and rather than letting this momentum overwhelm him, Tweak stayed calm and found an up smash on Sonics to clear his stock relatively unscathed. It was on the second and third stocks where Sonics began to slip away with this lead. His unbelievable control of Sonic made it hard for Tweak to consistently catch while down, and Sonics went on to win with a near JV2. Once again, Sonics Sonic started with a sizable lead over Tweak, but after an SD, the vibe seemed to switch up a little bit. Up two stocks to one, Tweak seemed to be in a very great position, but Sonic is a character you can't count out, and he was able to even up the game to one stock apiece with a Nair into forward smash. As Sonic slowly started to come back into the lead, things were looking grim for Tweak fans. Tweak was able to capitalize on a lazy spin dash through his shield, and he responded with a down tilt to back air confirmed to tie the set up at one game apiece. Game 3 had a similar beginning to the previous, as Sonic's racked up a strong lead on Diddy, but Tweak's ability to get value out of his stocks was shown on full display, getting Sonics to a more than killable percentage before losing his own. With blood, sweat, tears, and banana, Tweak scraped by with a Game 3 win and some much needed confidence. In Game 4, it was Tweak that started with and dropped the lead this time around, and Sonics began to snowball with it. In an attempt to close out an edge guard against an already dead Tweak, Sonics once again SD'd, this time at a low 26%. Quite possibly the best lifeline Tweak could have asked for. It was on this last stock where we saw Tweak's genius shine through. While Sonics' pressure is inevitable against any competitor, Editor he faces, it seemed like Tweak was just as aware of what Sonic wanted, and in turn, he made the right guesses over and over, finishing the final game of the set with a meaty forward air off stage, sending Sonics to the loser side of bracket, and guaranteeing a spot for himself in grand finals. On the loser side, we saw Spargo fight his way back for a chance at the title, including a 3 2 win in the run back against MK Leo, and he would have to face off against his rival Sonics. Spargo started with a game one win as Cloud and then counterpicked Corrin game two for another win. It was at this point where it seemed like Sonics had used up all of his 
momentum in an attempt to beat Tweak, and he was out of gas. But if there's one thing we know about Sonics, it's that you have to respect the vibes. While it was close, Sonics completed the reverse 3-0 on Spargo's combination of Cloud and Corrin to lock in a rematch against Tweak. We had finally reached Grand Finals, and in one corner we have Sonics, arguably the best player in the world at the moment, up against Tweak, a player that has held that title many times in the past and was looking to reclaim it, even if just for a single day. It was another Sonics lead to start the game, but call it skill, call it plot armor, call it whatever you want. Tweak somehow managed to fight back from yet another deficit defeat against Sonics. The awareness from Tweak overall was just unbelievable. As we mentioned before, it seemed like he was just all over what Sonics could do at any point of the match, and he had the correct response to it almost every time. Similar to the MK Leo set, we saw a full 20 seconds of unanswered damage from Tweak that eventually led to a stock and a 2-0 lead over the Dominican Republic's strongest player. In Game 3, it honestly looked like Tweak was going to make a 3-0 sweep over Sonics and claim his victory as he took the first stock with over 175% on himself, but Sonics slowly worked his way back and when the last stock rolled around, it was he who saw a major advantage. He closed out a clean conversion into a back air that nearly killed Tweak and chased him offstage to finish the job. He went for a homing attack and just like it had done in the previous set, it caused him to SD, going straight into the blast zone, losing the game, and securing Tweak a 3-0 victory, as well as the title of Luminosity Makes Big Moves champion. While that end might have been a little anticlimactic, this victory was still monumental for not only Tweak, but Tri-State as a region. At this event series, Tri-State has managed to defend their region for the fifth year now, and it was against extremely tough odds. For Tweak, this marks his third Makes Moves title, and he started another year as the first major winner. For fans of Tweak, and the beauty that can be found in Smash Ultimate, this was an amazing way to start the year. Hey, thank you so much for watching. And if you were too distracted by my sultry voice to notice that this is a brand new YouTube channel, this is where I'm going to be moving all of my ultimate content. So the best thing you can do to support that is to drop a subscribe so I can get monetized pretty quickly because in full transparency, uh... Yeah, there's no money left. Anyway, I really hope you guys like this change and let me know in the comments what you think about these types of videos. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.